what is the craziest travel experience that you have had? Once I was traveling from the US to India and when I'm flying over the Atlantic, one of the engines goes out. They had to land the plane in Iceland, in Reykjavik. Oh, f***. Your wife is like your anchor? Oh yeah, yeah, no difference. You need that. You need that stability. You need that anchor, that grounding. If you have that, you are blessed. The criticism I get is that I don't quote data and proofs enough when I can, which is why we've actually got the screen. Okay. Do you receive this kind of a data-based criticism? Uh, I get this uh, all the time, especially in YouTube shorts and all. I make a certain statement. They're saying, where's the proof? Is this content creation speaking or have you always been like this? Oh, it's content creation speaking. It's I've not always been like this. I'm kind of an ambivert. With some people, I'm really open. A lot of my friends friends in America and my American friends actually talk about Adderall in a pretty like chill way that yeah, we just took an Adderall. That's it. <laughs> so, was this there in your era of you being in college? What is God, sir? If you want computer scientist source perspective, God is the programmer of the universe. We've done so many episodes with Abhijit Chawda over the years. We usually follow the theme of knowledge extraction when he visits our studio, but in today's episode, I really wanted to bring out his human side. I personally believe that the whole world is turning to social media to market the businesses, to market themselves. The world is changing. It's changed so much just in the last four years. I truly feel content is at the center of that change. And it's not just me who feels that way. Nawal Ravikant said that if you want to secure your future, you need to either know how to code or create content. That's how you increase your passive income in the future. So, so many conversations related to content creation today. So many conversations related to Abhijit Chavda and my personal life, our journey as just guys. So, if you've watched any of our episodes and enjoyed the chemistry we share, I think you'll enjoy the slightly hutke episode. Uh, we've also gone into some deep science because that's how it goes with AC and myself. What you guys don't know is that me and him chill a lot after our recordings. We go out to the beach, we have dinner, we do a lot of brotherly shit. And this is going to be another brotherly episode. It's kind of a more casual approach to TRS. It's a special one with AC. Welcome to TRS Abhijit Chowda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, happy to be back on my favorite podcast. Thank you so much. Aray, thank you, sir. <laughs> Cheers. I was about to welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> I think this might be one of those episodes where it's less of information download for the audience and more a real conversation because hopefully that's what podcasting has become. Yeah. Cheers, sir. Cheers. Let's have some coffee. Oh, yeah. Mm. That's a good coffee. What do you make of it? Oh, I like the citrus notes. Yeah. So... Um, people in Mumbai know, especially media industry folks know, coffee has become a very big culture in Mumbai. I see. And you know, I've made videos in the past mm -hmm. when I was a fitness YouTuber about why you shouldn't have coffee at all. I see. And there is some truth in that if you're dealing with anxiety and you, you tend to get jittery with coffee. Mm -hmm. I've seen that as I aged, my personality slowed down a little bit. Okay. And I, I felt like my mind and my body was able to process coffee better mm -hmm. or I'm just making an excuse to have great coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. <man. laughs> mm. How do you feel about coffee? I like coffee. I have a coffee or two a day. It's usually black coffee. Mm. Um, I'm not against having other kinds of coffees, but I typically like it black. Mm. No sugar, just, just straight. No. Uh, apparently, I remember this on Joe Rogan, there was a coffee expert uh -huh. who came and said that, um, I think coffee was discovered in South America or Mexico, one of the two places. Mm -hmm. And when they brought it to Europe, it was in conjunction and there's data that backs this and we'll use our new screen to show the data. Okay. But there's data that showed that it was in conjunction with the beginning of the Renaissance period. Okay. Where, you, why don't you explain what the Renaissance period uh, was? The Renaissance was this time when Europe experienced a, a tremendous amount of prosperity. And in the Italian region in Fiorentina, Florence and all those regions, you had this gathering of artists because there were very wealthy patrons there. 
the Medici family, etc., etc. So a lot of artists gathered together, and there was this great efflorescence and uh, cross pollination of ideas, artistic ideas, and all that. And you had uh, this great artistic outpouring, you know, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, and so on and so forth. So that's called the Renaissance. It's not just paintings and sculpture; it's also architecture and all that. So that was the Renaissance in Europe. And science and engineering. Oh, uh, there was also a scientific revolution that went along with that. It kind of started in. England because of the Elizabethan era. So Elizabeth was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, wife of Henry the Eighth. Uh, he had her beheaded, but the daughter. <laughs> so the daughter was very, uh, very liberal. She did not like uh, the Catholic faith, so she went for Protestantism, and uh, she was very tolerant of new ideas and all that. So that's why science was able to take root in England in the, at the time. And you had all these great scientists, Newton, Boyle, blah blah blah, who came up with all these new ideas. Many of them were borrowed from from somewhere else, but let's not go into that thing. It's a kind of controversial topic. But yeah, you had a scientific revolution, you had this Renaissance, and then you had the Industrial Revolution, and we know the story. Hmm. Yeah. So I remember learning this from you that if science discovers something now, fifty years later, engineering will usually do something with that discovery. Well, typically, if it's about the the fundamental scientific ideas that this applies to, so if I were to if I were to dis discover the 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 true basis of gravity, for example, we don't understand gravity, gravitation. Why do things fall? Okay, we have Newton's law, and we have also have general relativity, and we also have quantum mechanics, which we don't we're not able to reconcile these things. But if I'm able to make a breakthrough and understand and come up with a theory of quantum gravity that actually works, it might take fifty hundred fifty years, maybe hundred years for us to make some technological use of that. But when it comes to new engineering breakthroughs and all, you could start using that immediately. So it depends on who is doing it. If it's a theoretical physicist who's working at the cutting edge of of physics, then that new discovery. May take a hundred years to bear fruit from the technological perspective. That, that's how it goes, depending on who's doing it and, and in what field and and how how fundamental the discovery is. But you know what? In the early nineteenth century, when all these when when quantum mechanics was being born, you know, when Einstein and all that these guys they used to they came up with these theories. There was this great coffee drinking culture in in Europe. So I don't remember where Einstein cut his teeth. Was it? Was it, I think it was Bern in Switzerland. But yeah, it, there was this great coffee drinking craze at the time. And I think uh, Einstein, where was he educated? Bern, Germany, somewhere. I'm not sure. But yeah, you know, he used to drink a lot of coffee, spend a lot of time outside the classes, bunk classes, go to coffee shops, drink coffee there, and you know. That, that that's where he would meet other thinkers and intellectuals and ideas would exchange would be exchanged and flow freely and all that so i think this coffee culture they, it did contribute to a lot of these uh, you know these ideas being exchanged and new ideas being being born in in, in the process mm. so yeah th that's the kind of thing that happened why do you think that do you think that the human mind actually gets a little amped up because of this black liquid i think it, it does uh, enhance focus it does uh, Enhance the heart rate. I mean, it it does up your heart rate a little bit. It does. It, maybe it's nootropic. You've know, heard of nootropics, right? So nootropics is a, is a class of substances, drugs, etc. Not drugs, but substances that kind of have this uh, cognitive boosting effect. So you go into a deeper state of focus. You kind of think better. Maybe you're if you do it for a certain amount of time. Maybe for a time, your intelligence levels may also increase a little bit. So I think coffee is one of those substances. Mm. It's it's a stimulant. And maybe it's a nootropic. 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 N double O T R O P I C. Nootropic. Mm. So what maybe. else would be a nootropic? Oh well, I've heard of various things. They even say that uh, that nicotine is a nootropic. So obviously, smoking is terrible. You get all this tar and soot and whatnot into your lungs. But uh, the, you know, there are some people. I, I would. I'm not recommending this by any sense. But there are some people who take those uh, nicotine cessation uh, gums hmm. and just chew that once a day or something, just to enhance the. The 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 focus and all that you know maybe that also works so maybe nicotine is a nootropic and there is something called modafinil uh, which is something that uh, helps you study better mm. it kind of wards off sleep for some time and all that so mm. these these are all nootropics I believe America has an Adderall problem I've heard of that yeah just just look up what what is Adderall Adderall A D D ha huh. it's it came yeah first one Adderall oral use side effects. uh go down bus combination medication is used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder adhd it seems like a new tropic from just the first line <laughs> it works by changing the amounts of certain natural substances in the brain amphetamine dextroamphetamine belongs to a class of drugs known as stimulants 
it can help increase your ability to pay attention stay focused on an activity and control behavior problems mm. it may also help you to organize your tasks and improve listening skills this drug is also used to treat a certain sleeping disorder to help you stay awake during the day it should not be used to treat tiredness or to hold off sleep in people who do not have a sleep disorder but mm. the reason i brought this up is uh, i hear a lot of my friends in america mm -hmm. and my american friends actually talk about adderall in a pretty like chill way that yeah we just took an adderall that's it <laughs> that's right. what are you doing bro <laughs> like yeah there is a how to use adderall but i'm sure you need to take it with medical guidance you can't just yeah uh was this there in your era of you being in college uh no there was no such thing those okay. days i have i've not heard of any such thing but these are people do pop these things i mean i think in the us army amphetamines were used to uh, given to fighter pilots for example who want who go on long missions maybe bomber pilots and all that because you know in the army in the armed forces you may have a 24 hour mission where you have to be intensely focused mm. and then in that in such circumstances maybe this sort of thing may perhaps be warranted mm. so i think the military is always at the forefront of these technologies and experimenting <laughs> with these things so there there we are there we yeah. have it you know um you know one criticism that i've got about american life in general from my friends who've gone there is that it's a pill oriented economy mm. like there's a pill for everything yeah and like even if you have a tiny like you know issue mm -hmm. like a headache etc the protocol for a lot of people there's take a pill that's right uh why do you think that is Well, that's a controversial <laughs> issue. Well, the pharmaceutical industry wants to maximize its profits, and there's a pill for everything. You have a headache, you have a knee ache, elbow ache, whatever. Take a pill. Uh, lots of people these days, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, but they identify as having various mental health issues and all that. So, mental health is a complicated topic. You cannot treat everything with chemicals, you know. Uh, often times these problems the 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 origins lie somewhere else in the in your circumstances in your life experiences in your upbringing in your childhood some trauma here or there and you can't treat everything with chemicals but with, that's the us system right now they treat everything with pills everybody takes god knows what pills there everybody if you open their their you know the drawer in, in above the sink the, behind the mirror there's a whole bunch of pills there prescriptions and all i don't think it's very healthy I think the the ideal uh, way to take care of yourself is to give time to yourself, get lots of sunsh sunshine, get sleep, and good food. I mean, mm. I think nutrition should be the best medicine you take. It's all preventive, actually. Mm. So I think that's that's my philosophy. That's my perspective. But yeah, in the US, there's a pill for everything. I think that is mm. kind of dangerous. You know what I'm feeling when you're saying all this? Mm -hmm. The same thing that I feel whenever we have you on the show, which is that yeah, I agree with AC. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. but the criticism that you and me collectively get is that you and me are in each other's echo chamber. Okay, because maybe we. So think why don't we disagree about something? What shall we disagree about? <laughs> I actually want to ask you yeah. the next question, which is also related to the same. Let's disagree about something situation. Mm -hmm. How's podcasting been for you? Because Good. we're having this chill conversation now, where people will actually get to know AC rather than us having geopolitical conversations yeah. and all that. Mm -hmm. And we've done so many podcasts together. Yeah, yeah. I actually think that you were one of the big like gear switches in my own podcasting journey. You introduced me to geopolitics, mm. science-based podcast began with you, etc. Mm. Uh, but yeah, my question now to you is: How is your podcasting journey? When you started a podcast, I saw that when I started mine, it shifted a lot of things within me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're going through the same. I may be going through the same. So my perspective, my my thing was that. I did not want to copy anybody. I did not want to compete with anyone. I want to do do my own thing. So initially, I started doing these online podcasts, online conversations. You know, across the screen, you have the screen in front of you, and you're talking to somebody across the screen, a Zoom call or whatever. That's how it started. And I noticed that yeah, it's interesting. You get lots of interesting uh, information, but it's there's there's a lack of connection. There's a lack of um, you know the chemistry over there because you're not face to face, and there's a slight time delay and all that. So it works well when you when there's somebody on the other side that you know well. so that works well but when you're talking to somebody for the first time it doesn't always work very well so i did a bunch of these uh, virtual podcasts and then i think uh, last year i decided i'm going to do only face to face podcasts and that's when everything uh, kind of changed so i started traveling to various places i don't have a studio like you i've not invested in that thus far at least so i would i would typically just take a hotel suite somewhere book it for like 5 6 7 days whatever it is and and set up a little mini studio there and do podcast there and i'd line up a bunch of people and i would do that so that was a very different experience 
and it kind of uh, yeah it's it's been a journey for me i've understood a lot of things you know how how interpersonal relationships work the perspectives of people who are in very different domains and fields i've seen that so it's been a very educative journey for me i mean i obviously am a very well read person but this is a whole different kind of yeah. education so i was again a lot from that this is what i want to add mm. uh this is hard core education that you go through as a podcasting oh, yeah. host mm-hmm. uh I don't think people understand that. Oh, yeah. Like just the download of information that podcast hosts get. It's very heavy duty because we are very aware that not all our consumers are consuming all the podcasts. Yeah. The only people who are consuming all the podcasts are the hosts and their teams. Which is weird but it's also a very cool experience and the reason I want to highlight this is because of most of the people I've met you're in the top 1 percentile of photographic memory oriented individuals. I feel like you have a photographic memory because you're able to dish out a lot of data and that i think everyone who's listening to this podcast for ac knows this about you like that you're able to actually pull out data from a lot of deep places which the average podcast guest is not able to do so i the moment i saw you doing podcast that was my first thought that okay now we're going to see super say in ac in like probably a year's time and two years time because i anticipate you're going to retain 90 to 100% of the information that you're getting downloaded on to show and i am able to retain stuff to a certain degree but definitely not to the degree you are able to re- retain it hmm. up to you, have you ever looked at it this way well uh, what i have one thing i've realized i've i've gained an immense amount of respect for the kind of work that you do you do so many podcasts and one thing as a podcast host is that you have to stay super focused you have to hang on to every word and you have to I mean, look at the person, what they're saying. Think about it, and then uh, think about what's the next. Uh, where where do you take this next? So it's a super focused kind of thing that you have to do. It's a super intense thing. For the viewer, it's just casual listening sometimes, okay. But as the podcast host, you have to be totally focused, and so so that's that's a very important thing. And the other thing that I've uh, seen seen is that you know I've I've tended to fo- to to follow my interests when I when it comes to podcast guests. So I did uh, a number of uh, classical dancers and artists and all that. The podcast views weren't great, but I enjoyed that, you know. So I've kind of tended to fo- follow what my interests are. I am interested in so many different things. Mm. I'm interested in sports, I'm interested in martial arts, in classical music, classical dance and so many things. So I followed that, but also I I do kind of now understand what the viewers want and what the viewers don't uh, often want to see or where the interests aren't aren't there maybe it's because of the kind of channel that i have that you have this sort of thing but that's what so i have gained an immense amount of respect for podcast hosts like you i mean uh, when it comes to you sitting in front of me and i'm talking about all kinds of things it must be challenging to just focus mm-hmm. on what i'm saying and you know not with you not with you because we've chilled so much hmm. it's different with you You're okay. that. I know the category, <laughs> but you're right. It, mm. It's very challenging to meet people for the first time, especially if the person comes from a dark domain like military veterans. Mm. You know, people associated with the world of crime. Mm. Dark for the lack of a better word, heavy. Mm. You know, more fierce domain. Mm. Tantrics. Tantrics. Wow. Like mm. just. these kind of podcasts can get a little heavy duty mm. and then you have to do it every day right <laughs> that's indeed the, yeah 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 i think that's what people don't understand mm. uh there is a slightly slightly arrogant part of me mm. where i am proud that i shoot every day yeah, and i think that's like you know that's that's not easily replicable it's not actually yeah. it's easier said than done i mean people may imagine that it's easy to just sit there and ask a few questions and do a podcast it's not easy at all it's extremely challenging mentally very draining i'm sure after each podcast shoot you must be feeling mentally drained and exhausted i feel calories get burnt oh yeah yeah, yeah. i mean you know what that's an interesting parallel in chess so whenever there's a chess tournament and there's a bunch of grandmasters and let's say the tournament is a week it's it's a week long you will find that each of these grandmasters at the highest level they typically lose about 10 kilos in a week's time just sitting damn. and playing chess damn so it's all the mental effort that's been that's been all that all those calories being consumed by the brain the mental effort yeah. so yeah i'm sure pretty sure lots of calories get burnt as the host yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. You, you get very drained if you have a day full of forget day even if you have two podcasts in a day mm-hmm. you're great till that second podcast is almost ending the mm. moment it ends there's an energy drop sometimes there are tears mm. sometimes there is just a kind of i want to give up now moment mm. and then you sleep you wake up the next day my producer sends me my list of uh, you know research points mm-hmm. and suggestions for the show 
and then and back to normal back on the train yeah yeah you get saturday sunday to chill mm yeah that's good that's good you should always <laughs> have some kind of time off somewhere you know huh? yeah what's your time off at this stage in life because you actually lived a very interesting life that people don't know about i know this because we hang out i think people only know your geopolitics science and history side and whatever you expose on the internet but you're just an interesting bro to have if someone can unlock all that stuff <laughs> about you which i've gotten to know about through the conversations we have post our recordings yeah we do yeah uh, we've had some pretty intense conversations but i've actually gotten to know you mm -hmm. that's my intention with this episode as well mm. uh you can begin with like a how are your weekends right now mm -hmm. uh how's life how are you thinking about your future mm -hmm. in some ways and then we can go back to your childhood because that's a whole other story mm. so look my i don't have weekends i have days and i'm i i typically have a calendar that i follow so i have my calendar planned out for the next let's say 2 months uh pretty solid and then next few months it may be a little hazy a little vague and i just take a look at the calendar for today and i just follow it like a slave that's what i do and i have a day in the week in which i plan the next week's calendar and that sort of thing and often a month's calendar as and when things fall into place that's what i do i typically don't know what day of the week it is if you ask me what day is it today i'll know the date but not the day yeah. is this content creation speaking or have you always been like this it's content creation speaking it's i've not always been like this so i've worked jobs and then when you're working jobs you know what day it is because you know what when the weekend is and all that mm. so now i have no idea what day it is i just know the date and i know what i have to do today and that sort of thing and i typically it may not be a very healthy thing to do but i typically work 7 days a week kind of i'm always do working on something mm. so when i do podcast i don't do podcast every day like you're doing like twice a day or whatever your schedule is i typically have um, a podcast uh, shooting trip like once in 2 months in which i shoot like 8 or 10 podcast maybe and then i'm done and i'm releasing just one podcast every weekend so uh, it's a pretty chill schedule for me when it comes to podcasting that's how it is but i'm always researching something i do geopolitical analysis videos and other things and i do live streams so i always have something on my plate and i'm working on other things as well so it's always that i always have something that i'm working on typically it's reading typically it's research typically it's formulating things and so on and so forth so it's always something going on uh what are you thinking about in terms of the future and mm. the reason i ask you this is there is this theory out there and i am not sure whether it's a true theory or not because i'm blindsided to this okay because the theory is about content creation uh -huh. and because i've been doing content creation so long that i've yeah. probably lost that perspective on what life outside of content creation is like mm -hmm. if you're not a content creator what is your life like i don't know yeah. because my whole adult life has been content creation right so they say that everyone's trying to become a content creator a to z hmm because yeah. earlier the angle was oh build your personal brand nowadays they say that no dude even if you're getting hired even if you want to build something perhaps 10 years later you should begin marketing yourself now is that the truth about the world like what do you think because if that is the case uh i don't doubt the introverts but i'm curious to know how they would go about it as well and you're introverted I am introverted. I'm kind of an ambivert. With some people, I'm really open, typically reserved, that sort of thing. But yeah, what you're saying is true. I mean, the the, the philosophy or the wisdom out there today is that everybody should create content. If you're shy, if you don't want to face, show your face somewhere, write a blog or or write a post on LinkedIn or be be on Twitter. But you got to create some content, and people that should be your resume essentially. You know, go your future employer should go to your LinkedIn, your Twitter, or whatever it is, and they should be able to get a good perspective of who you are based on that. So everybody is getting into some kind of content creation. When it comes to podcasting, I think I get the feeling <laughs> podcasting has turned into a cottage industry in India. Everyone's getting into Into, pod, into podcasting, everybody has a podcast. I mean, absolutely no disrespect meant to anybody, but uh, it seems like, and you're the pioneer. You are the guy who started it all, and now everyone's jumping on the bandwagon. So maybe we need to find something new to do, perhaps, or maybe continue the podcast, but in our own unique ways. So I think that's the kind of thing we have out there today about introverts. While introverts can always write, I think introverts are always are actually typically good at expressing themselves uh, in in writing mm. as opposed to verbally. Mm. So there's always something for some for for everyone, I guess. So yeah, there's a lot of content creation happening right now. I don't think there's ever been a time when more content comes out in the public domain on the internet every single day. uh the way it's happening right now so there's a, a ton and a lot of of content out there every day yeah uh i'm going to highlight a piece of criticism that both you and me get you to a lesser degree mm -hmm. because of your photographic memory in many ways me to a much larger degree uh -huh. and i'm not making excuses here but i've thought about why i've been doing this thing that's not 
being received well hmm? so criticism i get is that i don't quote data and proofs enough okay uh when i can which is why we've actually got the screen okay to keep pulling up stuff hmm. i met a neuroscience professor at a an event i was at recently very positive he watches the show he's like you need to start catching your guests and not letting them move on in conversation and asking them um to actually bring out data about what they are saying okay uh hmm. like if if they can show data it just makes their argument stronger okay then of course even after they've shown data if you want you can wrestle with them hmm. or let the conversation move forward and that's your nuance as an interviewer hmm. uh i took this feedback well because it's coming from a professor of neuroscience who hmm. is a deep thinker very obviously hmm. uh and he watches the show, show. Okay. so it's from a positive place it's not a twitter of troll course. who's at it yes um we've got the screen hmm do you do you receive this kind of a data based yeah. criticism do you, yeah. do you accept it so the point is this see i get this uh, all the time especially in youtube shorts and all i make a certain statement and they're saying where's the proof why mm. don't you show some proof or i do a live stream and i you know answer let's say 30 questions over a pe- two hour period people say where's the proof show the evidence my point is this you're doing a live show if i interrupt the show and start pulling up data and information it's going to be a five hour show and people are going to doze off mm. and people are going to lose interest if you want information take it from me it may be flawed it may be right do your own research do your own due diligence you have google at your, at your fingertips who's stopping you yeah. that's how you learn it, it the conversation just doesn't flow when you just stop and say okay show us the data yeah. go there and we look at a bunch of stuff yeah. and then we pull up this no no this let's take the other one that kills the entire flow of the conversation yeah, so podcasts are see this is not a lecture Mm. when you have a professor who's giving a lecture that person has the textbook with him he says refer to page number so and so or refer to this te- uh, textbook chapter so and so and look it up do your homework that's what he tells the students or there's this equation on the on the blackboard now you solve it for yourself that's your homework that's how you learn so that's the that's the same philosophy you know i'm going to talk about stuff sometimes i may be wrong sometimes i may slip up it's happened Mm. Okay I may I may say the the wrong thing sometimes once in a while that's always a risk that you run when you're doing a live show or you're doing a podcast sometimes you mess up somewhere but it's up to the viewer if they really want to learn then they take this piece of information do your own research and find out what the actual truth is whether this person is whatever he or she is saying is right or wrong that should be the way you should approach a podcast if you want to really want to learn something so that's mm. my perspective too. I think I think people hold us up against journalism degrees <laughs> in terms of i think we are viewed in some way as new age journalists i don't think we view ourselves no. as that no. at all at all we're just content creators yeah. uh, we're having fun in this job we mm-hmm. want to bring you the truth because we are also an audience member at the end of the day we're as interested in these topics as you are uh, what you're saying is exactly right and that's the thought that i am wrestling with in my head as well that my charm as a podcaster is the state of flow that i can put my guest into there you go yeah. am i yeah, right you been absolutely a, and it breaks the flow when i keep referencing the screen yeah uh, unless it's like a another round where it's a pre planned experiment etc yes if it's a pre planned thing then you have to sit together for an hour or so yeah. talk out go through all the points and keep every, all the references ready well that also kills the vibe of the show because then it's just a lecture mm. you know it's mm. not a free flowing conversation there's no spontaneity to it the the charm is gone you know you just know what each other that you're going to talk about so yeah. there's no fun in that yeah uh, this is what people don't understand about the difficulty of being a content creator actually is hmm. but did i see i messed up my grammar i think right now like did you i got a feedback loop in my own head okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my point is it it is difficult to run a content creation career because you're getting so many inputs your mind wrestles with thoughts just like this in terms of right now you kind of disagreed with what he said hmm. these same two things have been going on there's a micro ac in my head and there's a micro dr avatramani in my head okay. battling it in terms of hey what's the next step you should take for the podcast hmm. and this has just been how the ATOs have okay. uh, panned out hmm. so it takes a, it takes a little bit of a mental toll on you for sure like oh, for me it doesn't you know i'm pretty clear that i'm not going to go out and pull up references and do all that stuff it's it's the viewer if they are interested they can look it up do their own uh, due diligence verify what i'm saying if if i'm wrong then put a comment out that, that here is the truth here mm. here are the links there is the references so that's how i see it the problem is that uh, you know the education system has made everybody very uh, enamored of spoon feeding 
Mm. You know, the, the edu- education system, especially in India, doesn't teach anyone to think critically. They just don't know how to think and how to verify or uh, cross-check facts. They just don't know how to do it. They sim- can't even do a simple Google search. If they do a Google search, they don't know what's an authoritative source and what's not. They'll give you Wikipedia references mm. and that sort of thing. I do not blame the viewers for this. They are victims of the education system. They don't know how to think. They are wrestling with what, what do I believe? What do I not believe? And then they go all emotional and whoever resonates the most emotionally mm. from content creation perspective, they're going to just listen to what he or she says. Mm. And everybody else is wrong. Mm. That's the sort of thing it is because we have not been taught how to think critically. So I totally empathize with the viewers and I totally understand where they're coming from. But I am very clear that I am not going to waste my time, you know, do, during a live stream or during anything, throwing out a bunch of links and a bunch of references because that takes double the time. Do it yourself. You know, learn, evolve, all that. If I write a book, obviously I'll give all the references. If I do a course, obviously I'll give all the references. But during a live stream, during a 20-minute video, I'm not going to do that. Maybe I'll put a few out there, but not a whole lot. That's, mm. I'm, I'm pretty clear about this. Mm. Um, this thing you said about the Indian education system. Yeah. It's something that sticks out on so many levels. It's not just the Sharma ji ke beta ki mentality. Hmm. Have you heard of Sharma ji ka beta? No. Sharma ji ka beta mentality means a lot of parents tell their own kids that why have you come third in your class? Look at Sharma ji's beta. He's come first. He's come first. Okay, that way. Hmm. Now that causes a lot of psychological trauma on that child. And this hmm. happens to so many Indian kids who grow up into adults who constantly compare themselves to like other adults. Hmm. Uh, now, if you're a good human being, you'll understand that, oh, my heart is making me compare myself to that person. That's okay. I guess this is my own childhood trauma. Hmm. And I don't actually need to voice out vitriol or venom onto that person's reality Mm -hmm. but the thing is if you have a certain level of anger slash actual envy inside you you'll want to voice it out you'll want to pull other people down Mm -hmm. and if you have a very very high level of it you become an x troll x troll yeah not ex like twitter troll okay x troll (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i know what you mean yeah i think that's where the garbage of society rests Hmm. on the internet Mm -hmm. in terms of the people who have the maximum amount of venom become Twitter trolls. And often Hmm. you'll see with Twitter trolls that if you scan through their Twitter feeds, there's too many tweets tweeted out in a day. Firstly, Hmm. okay. Too many tweets Hmm. and at least once a day they'll criticize or troll something. I think that's the nature of the platform. Also just how that platform is built. It's not the, vibe that Instagram is built with. Okay. That's honestly what I feel it is. Which actually means it has a lot of great content as well. When you read an insane thread on Twitter, Mm -hmm. when you get insane life lessons, insane insights, when you get into the mind of the world leaders, the the actors, the athletes, that's the positive side of Twitter. Hmm. The negative side is this unfulfilled adults who want to only be within their own echo chambers and are not open to other perspectives. Right. I think Twitter makes it very easy to do that. So the way I see it is that if somebody, if you were to meet somebody face to face, you would be polite with them, even if you disagree with them, you would be respectful, you would not start a fight right there. But it's so easy to do that on Twitter, just send out a 180 character tweet. And there you have there you have it. You, you can, you know, release some of that pent up whatever that you may have within you. So it's very easy to do that. But on the other side, Twitter has so much great content, so many tremendous threads. You get to hear the views of world leaders, like you just said. So for me, I tweet very often, very, very less these days. I retweet various people once in a while, but I tweet very less. I these days I'm subconsciously maybe. I'm I'm using Twitter as as a, as a as a news gathering mechanism, a place where you can see what's happening in the world wherever it is in real time, and it, it kind of adds to the context that you have when it comes to geopolitical events and politics and and whatnot, you know. Mm. So that's how I see Twitter these days. I don't tweet so much these days, and I, I I try to remind myself that it's very easy to react over here, and you may end up uh, not maybe wording something clumsily and then people may interpret it in some other mm. way. So you got to be careful on all these platforms. So mm. that's how I say Twitter. I mean, YouTube, it's it's your own thing. You can, you can tailor it to whichever way you want. And there are so many other platforms. Instagram, it's an interesting uh, distribution channel, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> There's LinkedIn as well, where people have all these uh, very specific kind of posts and all that. To uh, it, it's, it's essentially for hiring and, and uh, 
and selling and stuff like that. Maybe not selling so much, hiring. And it's a job market, essentially, online job market. So each platform has its own nuances. But Twitter is where all the angry people come to fight. That's what I see. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you have bros your age? I do have a few, yeah. What's their life like versus your life as a career switched content creator? Um, most of the bros I have have very, uh, I would say from my perspective, kind of mundane and boring lives. You know, doing a job, some of them are very successful, traveling the world, you know, you know, winter in, in one continent, uh, summer in another continent, coming to India four times a week. I just met a friend of mine a couple of days ago who lives in Australia. And uh, he travels a lot, but he has a very straightforward job. He doesn't have a lot of, uh, of course, the, the traveling gives a lot of um, variety in your life. But uh, the sort of thing that we go through, that's not there. So, yeah, I mean, there are people what, who... What, what do we go through? And I want to know this as yeah. a life learning because I don't have perspective mm. on life outside of content creation. Mm. This thing that you and me are doing, what what is it? What is it resulting in? Yeah, what's it resulting in? We are always out there in the public domain. We are whether we like it or not, public figures. And everything we do is open to public scrutiny. You do something and there's going to be all kinds of reactions from here, some quarter or the other, that sort of thing. So your life is extremely uh, intensely uh, scrutinized. At least your online life is. And obviously, if you're doing it all the time, then your real persona is out there in public. So yeah, you are always being scrutinized 24 by 7. People can pull out old videos, old tweets, whatever, and talk about you. You did this, you did that. I'm sure you've gone through that. Uh, I'm sure you get uh, reactions from all quarters about various things. And they don't realize that people evolve over time. What I was 10 years ago is not necessarily who I am today. The core characteristics are the same. I actually, at the very core fundamental level, am still the same person that I was when I was five years old. Mm. I know that. Yeah. But I have obviously life experiences, circumstances, all that has added so many layers to our personalities and that's what everybody goes through. So you may have to, I mean, if I think of myself 10 years ago, I probably would say I was so naive and so silly. And I had such a, you know, uh, misguided views about various things. I'm sure 10 years down the future, the future me would look back at me today and maybe say the same thing. So we're always evolving. Our tastes are evolving. Our perspectives are evolving. Our beliefs also may be evolving. So just because you said something some a few years ago doesn't mean that the same person and you may to, to today not believe the same thing. But that's what we are open to. We are open to public scrutiny. We are all, Our life is always being examined by the viewers. And that's what we have chosen for ourselves. So it's a roller coaster ride for us. For most people, well, they can curate what they put out of themselves on Instagram or wherever. And some of them may not even have an online persona or an online profile. So life is very uh, stable for them. There are no none of these ups and downs. And it's, it's a, a very few parameters to worry about. For us, we have so many parameters to worry about. Like? I mean, uh, YouTube. It has so many different parameters. The number of views you get, the, the likes you get, the dislikes you get the comments you get, the way people see you, then you have various other other, other uh, platforms and all that. Then you have uh, uh, your relationships. Obviously, you will have lots of business relationships because of what you're doing. So you have to address each of them individually. Lots of parameters in there also. You have to balance certain things sometimes. There's so much that we do that we may not consciously think about, but it's all there. So the more you do, the more... Uh, free parameters you have in there in the equation in the differential equations I mean that's how I see it <laughs> <laughs> and most people don't have so much of that so I think life is uh, uh, much simpler for them and they have less to worry about if they do if they are the worrying type so th that's how it's different I would say so what do you think this experience of life does to one's human mind I think the more you experience the, the richer and more complex you, your experiences are and I think that, I mean, it, it depends on you. I mean, if, if you can handle that sort of thing, if you enjoy new experiences all the time, it's great. You get to travel, you get to meet people, you get to be, be put in different milieus, different kind of environments. And if you enjoy that sort of dive, those diverse experiences, it's for you. But if you like a life of stability and not too much of, of that, uh, you know, ups and downs, then you maybe not be cut out for this sort of public life and all that. So that's how I see it. I, I have always been an open-minded person. I always enjoy new experiences. I've always enjoyed traveling. I've always enjoyed meeting new people, even though I may be an introvert, but I still enjoy all this. I really do. So for me, it's fine. And I I don't really worry too much about what other people think as as. So I'm, I'm good, you know. Do you think one needs to be a little f up to be experimental? Um, you got to be different. You got to be slightly crazy to do this. I mean, you know, 
out of the 52 cards one or two may be a little bit misaligned that that kind of works for you little, little whacked out something yeah. some eccentricity needs to be there oh yeah absolutely i'm sure i'm a little bit eccentric at least all all the content creators who sustained who've been on the show mm. all of them are eccentric mm. in some weird way <laughs> like i that's just a theory i have yeah uh, i met i met some of my engineering bros like mm. you know the core group mm-hmm. the ones the ones who eventually would be in the scene in the movie of your life if they were okay. yeah yeah your core group yep Sushant Singh movie that come out about engineering bros, Chichore. Chichore, okay. Yeah, my Chichore bros. I see. So uh, I met them. Vibe is still the same. Hmm. You know. That's the great thing about it. You know. Yeah. They still make fun of you. Yeah. Still talk shit. And you need that. Yeah. You need that. You yeah. need that that grounding, that balance in life. Mm-hmm. So when you meet your old friends, your old bros, you gotta have the same dynamic. Otherwise, it's like you lost it. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so you need that in life. Just that shouldn't go. That, that shouldn't you go. You should have a few anchors in your life. Maybe family. Oh, yes. Not maybe family. Definitely family. Definitely family. Uh, definitely bros. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would also go. You would have a better outlook on this, but mm-hmm. definitely romantic partner. Yeah. Wife. Yeah, obviously. Yes. Your wife that. is like your anchor. Oh yeah, yeah. She treats me the same. No difference. No, no difference between content creator, AC, and doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah, that, that you need that. You need that stability. You need that that anchor, that grounding. That certain things are constant, no matter w- whether you have ups or downs in life. Certain things stay constant. You really need that. If you have that, you are blessed. Actually, mm. yeah, you need that. Yeah, uh, the one thing I did notice about them is that uh, even the day I met them, they were slightly less experimental than I was about things. Okay, just generally, uh-huh. like I pitched that we should call our whole engineering. batch you mm-hmm. know to meet us on that same night okay. and they were a little hesitant about the um impulsive nature of that statement okay but i still put the message on my engineering group that night and people showed up okay. so these guys were hesitant about that whole process that no way it planned it would just be us etc okay. mm-hmm. and that made me a little bit reflective in terms of hmm has content creation done this to me where i seek novelty from life experiences hmm i don't know do you have you had this um i've always sought novelty in life i've always sought new experiences i've always sought to travel to places that others want travel to and even if i travel to a place where everybody does travel i have always sought out a different path so i've always been like that um but yeah yeah so i agree i am i'm that sort of person i always seek out something different i always seek out some novelty maybe a little bit of thrill here and there as far as mm. it's not too dangerous hopefully that sort of mm. thing but yeah that, that's that's the, there is that aspect to my personality i i want new experiences mm. want to experience new things what is the craziest travel experience that you have had your mind with uh-huh. that much data that much perspective on all these different subjects we've spoken about over the years i want to know what was a very impactful travel destination for you um impactful travel destinations i have been to yellowstone i have been to various places uh they all none of them none of those destinations stands out to me as something special or spectacular but certain journeys i can remember i mean sure. journey is the typical thing that's more interesting than the destination what do you mean uh experiences sometimes it's hardship for example once i was traveling from the us to india and i was traveling my company had paid for that so they had booked the cheapest possible flight so i had i think somewhere in the us maybe new york to london and london to somewhere in the middle east and then to india and what happens is that when i'm travel when i'm flying over the atlantic one of the engines goes out okay there's a sudden flickering of the lights and the light go out for a second or two they come back the masks drop down but then everything is fine so out of three engines we had lost one So then what happens is that they had to land the plane the aircraft in Iceland in Reykjavik. Oh f- yeah and then they we spent 6 hours there and then they put us back on the same plane and they took us to London Amsterdam I think Amsterdam. So I missed my connecting flight then I had to spend 11 hours in Amsterdam stuck there. Uh, they put me on a KLM flight to Dubai I think and then in Dubai I was there for 13 hours and then I was finally back in Mumbai. I reached Mumbai and then I discovered that one of my bags has gone to Ukraine Odessa. why just i have no idea confusion why. yeah confusion of some kind so i had to then again wait another 2 3 days for that it was a hell of a journey like i think probably more than 48 hours long extremely taxing tiring i could not even sleep so yeah that was a journey that i'll never forget so you get such experiences once in a while it's it's kind of fun actually it's a, you just go with the flow how did it feel when the engine went off ah uh, i was okay but the gentleman next to me he was an elderly english gentleman he was like all sweaty he was asking me are we going to die I said we're gonna be fine. So yeah, that guy was the guy next to me. 
kind of lost it. And then we are back on the same flight again after six hours, and he's back next to me, and then he's asking me, "I need to. I've missed my connecting flight. Which one should I take?" And all he's looking at something. So yeah, <laughs> I was okay. I, I surprisingly didn't panic or anything. I was maybe your things would be fine. I recently saw a film which, the moment I completed, landed into my top ten films I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And you wait for films like this. Mm-hmm. You wait for films to enter your top ten list. I see. Uh, I have to tell you about it. Do please. Okay. So this movie that broke into my top ten mm-hmm. is a movie called Society of the Snow. Society of the Snow. Yes, and I highly recommend it to all the viewers, listeners, everyone who's tuned into this episode. Um, deeply impactful movie, spiritual movie. Um, most of all, it's based on a true incident, and I warn you, it's a discomforting watch. I see. Okay, the movie is about the 1972 plane crash in the Andes Mountains. Ah ha ha! You heard of this story? Yes, I have. Don't don't give out the one spoiler that I know is coming to your mind. Yeah, because that's that one trope in the movie is one of the key elements, and I want people who've never heard of the story mm. to actually go and watch that film. Absolutely. But the context that you need to know before you watch it is. Uh, it will really make you question life survival uh the positives of the journey of life uh it will discomfort you a lot you will think about death the plot points that you need to know is that it's based on a true story about a rugby team that was going from uruguay to chile for a tournament i think uh and their plane crashes in the andes mountains and they get isolated from the rest of the world for 2 months mm. so the rest of the world thinks that they're dead no one really goes out to search for them and they're not able to find them searches are not able to locate them so they have to survive in the andes mountains and there's a very detailed trajectory of what happens i had read about the story i'm sure you've read about the story yes. the first time i read about the story years ago mm-hmm. my first thought was damn someone needs to make a movie on this <laughs> uh, and if they do it well it'll be one of the greatest movies ever this movie hit the spot for me it was mm-hmm. a 10 on 10 movie Okay. Nothing out change. I see. Spanish movie. There is an English dub available. I see. Um, ca- cannot recommend it enough. Okay, I'll check it out. Yeah, I will. What do you think of um, just dark and discomforting films? Because I've seen that with the audience members, the younger audience members are very chill with them. They actually look forward to darker films, which is why darker content is working. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see a lot of people my age and above not so. positive about consuming too much dark content mm-hmm. uh because they believe that you know they watch movies for just entertaining themselves or to feel better about life mm. but i think once in a while a discomforting movie should be watched and for me it's the reason i watch movies i want movies to f- up a little bit mm. i want to be able to think about that movie for weeks after i've watched it mm-hmm. sometimes i mean if you're giving 2 to 1/2 2 3 hours to something you want it to have an impact on you you do yes My question to you is, which is that movie for you? Oh, I've seen so many movies. I'm a huge movie buff. You know, if I had the chance, I would not mind watching two movies a week on the big screen. If good movies were to be yeah. available on the big screen, and if it's a guarantee that yeah, this movie will be good. Yeah. Like, if I know the outcome of the movie, I'll watch the movie. Mm. But it takes me a lot to like take a recommendation from people because yeah. I I don't think too many great films are made nowadays. Nowadays, you don't see too many great movies. Uh-huh. I mean, it's really hard to find good movies these days. I believe there'll be a bounce back. Martin Scorsese had said something about this. I think uh-huh. his quote just pull up the quote. Martin Scorsese had said something along the lines of, "The Avengers films mm-hmm. have killed cinema." <laughs> because everything has become a superhero movie because yeah it's all formula like yeah formula producers go wherever the money is and yeah. for the last 10 15 years just mm. like martin scorsese avengers for the last 10 to 15 years uh hollywood was fully focusing on avengers films and superhero films yeah so uh no no time martin scorsese avengers he expresses belief that marvel movies lack the depth and emotional complexity he associated with traditional cinema and that yeah. is so that true. is so true absolutely could not agree more yeah what is a great film you have watched from the 90s 80s 70s whenever oh i've seen so many great movies i as a kid i loved star wars there's the hero's journey in there you know yeah. luke skywalker starts from nowhere he's on a he's a, he's a farm hand mm. and he has he's like he's a good for nothing kid and then he goes and becomes this hero 
and he goes through this entire personal journey and evolution and all that so you had star wars i loved science fiction i watched alien scared mm. the heebie jeebies out of me as a kid little kid then i watched aliens 2 3 all that uh the good the bad the ugly ugly <laughs> tremendous movie you learned so much from these movies i watched japanese movies yo jimbo the seven samurai and so on i've seen akira kurosawa what's the vibe of japanese movies Oh, very artistic. I mean, many of these Western movies, the the cowboy movies, were copied from that. For example, what's the De- Dirty Seven or Deadly Seven or something? It's copied from one of the maybe the Seven Samurai or something. They copy the story. Uh, they've taken the theme and the story and they've turned it into a Western movie, a cowboy the- movie. Theme is what. The theme is that there are seven samurai who come to this town that is being outrun, that's been overrun by outlaws, and then they reestablish. order and that sort of thing that's that's a overall kind of storyline that. that sort of thing so i have seen so many movies i have uh, there are so many movies i mean i i have watched dark movies as well uh, one of the movies i can recall is called event horizon it's kind of uh, a science fiction movie with uh, horror elements in it i remember watching the ring <laughs> which was kind of a very dark very dark movie the entire thing the entire color palette is dark and blue and yeah. green and all that it really pulls you into that demonic world yeah, when does. you watch the ring so there's no gore in that there are no jump scares it's all uh, psychological horror you know? yeah yeah it's a very intense and deep movie the ring yeah i don't think too many people have seen the ring oh it's you a know? great movie it's one of yeah. the classics like i hear people my age and older than me talk about the ring a lot i never hear a younger person talk about the ring but hmm. this movie scared the shit <laughs> out of you without jump scares no jump scares you were a kid yeah that's what yeah like the scenes with the ghost are actually stretched over Four, five, six minutes. Mm. They have these entire edited montages, and the whole montage is meant to slowly scare you, slowly pull you in, and, and it it won't let you go. <laughs> Samara. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a remake of a Japanese movie, Ringo, and the original ghost was called Sadako, and they made remade this into a into a Hollywood movie, and it the first one worked out really well. The second one kind of uh, was let let down, but yeah, that's how things typically go. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I. uh the one of the recent movies that was great was interstellar it's yeah. kind of a classic today it's already becoming a classic i wanted to talk about interstellar to you in detail mm-hmm. uh interstellar is one of those very rare movies that ages like fine wine oh yeah every time you watch it you gain something else and if you keep watching it as you age you pull out a new aging lesson and mm. i am 100% sure that christopher nolan thought of that when he was constructing that movie hmm. uh when i first saw it it was a lot of data to take in mm-hmm. the second time i saw it i understood the story way better because that's the case with many nolan films you need to see it the second time to truly understand the depth of it hmm. the third time i saw it i realized the finesse in filmmaking and hmm. the finesse in editing and the music and how it adds to the whole film the fourth time i saw it i understood what he was actually trying to say which is that human emotions are the most powerful thing in the universe at the end of the sto- <laughs> at the end of the day it's an emotional story it's about yeah. emotions very powerful emotions so i've seen the movie twice i saw it twice within a week's time on the big screen the first time i was like blown away with the whole thing the second time i just wanted to re-experience those emotions again i mean it's a science fiction movie i mean the black hole is perfect you know from a general general relativity perspective but at the end of the day it's an emotional story and very few movies evoke those emotions you know how guys are we tend to be stoic we don't uh, we're not too emotional i mean m- m- most of us are emotional but we don't display or advertise those emotions unless one of us scores a goal <laughs> <laughs> and then the yeah. other guys get yeah, yeah, out around yeah. so i yeah so that's the kind of movie that uh, evokes certain emotions kind of like gladiator gladiator is also one of those guys movies right mm. i mean they say that girls cry when they watch titanic and guys cry when they see when they watch gladiator uh that sort of thing so yeah well i just got goosebumps when i said that <laughs> for people who seen gladiator oh great movie yeah so yeah there are certain movies that stand out matrix is one of those mm. movies the original the first one mm. matrix tremendous movie makes you question reality oh yeah they escape the matrix <laughs> mm. um in interstellar mm-hmm. there is a very stark difference in tonality at one point in this film when spoiler alert sorry guys i'm going to count till 3 and then we'll kind of go down the spoiler route So, if you don't want to listen about this, uh, move forward in the podcast a little bit. Three, two, one. For those of you who've seen Interstellar, there's a point where Matthew McConaughey and his crew actually go into space. Yeah. Uh, and the tonality of the movie switches. Mm-hmm. They bring in music, and at 
some point in the movie when their ship is crossing saturn mm-hmm. there is this one scene where they show the ship crossing saturn and there is no sound effect that they've used there's just silence silence is the sound effect yes and you feel like you are crossing saturn you do yes when you're watching that yeah on the big screen oh yeah. my god oh i have used that to explain so many detailed filmmaking uh that whole film uh-huh. not just that scene that whole film is a master class in emotional filmmaking oh yes it is yeah you have anything to say about yeah yeah, yeah. i mean you can uh, experience for yourself the immensity of space for example when the spaceship crosses saturn you can see the immensity of the planet and and how small and fragile and tiny the spaceship is then you go to the wormhole and it's for the first time they've shown that the that a wormhole is actually spherical it's not a hole in space it's spherical when you go through it and you emerge on the other side and then you have this uh, black hole what was it called gargantua or something mm. and then you see the the how tiny the how microscopic a speck the spacecraft is compared to the the accretion disk around around the, the black hole so you can see those contrasts about how small we are the greatest of our creations how tiny and insignificant they are are compared to the vastness of space and then you have the the, the emotional story the the aging the time dilation the father sees his kid as his daughter as as a teenager as a 13 12 year old girl and then he reunites with her when she's in, in her 90s and then you feel those emotions that you know he missed her entire life and yet she has done well and she always held on to his promise that he would come back and return to her i mean a masterpiece of a movie it's emotions and science and science fiction and movie and and movie making and storytelling and and music Oof. all of that combined together absolute masterpiece uh i'm not asking the scientist in you this but mm-hmm. the human being yeah. what did it change in the human being in you considering the fact that you're a scientist i changed nothing from the scientific perspective but uh i just loved the emotion it evokes in you sometimes it's awe sometimes it's grandeur sometimes it's tenderness sometimes it's sorrow and and so much more i mean that's what you want to experience in a movie it should play on all all these factors and yeah i mean i i am a deep believe, believer in human connection i mean you can't connect with everybody but the ones that are close to you you have to connect with them like deeply and that's what it shows the connection between uh uh a, a a professor and his student the connection between a father and his child connection between siblings and how sometimes siblings drift apart which happens in real in real life, real life and all those things and overall this guy goes out with his crew to save humanity and then he succeeds and then he has to go out and save somebody else somewhere else that that uh, the character played by Anne, Anne Hathaway, Hathaway. so all that i mean so many different um, layers of emotions and relationships and all that beautiful really like why the I'm getting goosebumps right now. It's just a film, but <laughs> that's, that's 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 what thing. filmmaking is. That's what it should be. Man. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like showing you this one clip from one of our old podcasts. It was from the Vadala Studio. Okay. It was with Swami Mukund Anand. So just pull it up. Sure. You'll have to put volume, and this is our copyright only, so we won't put a copyright strike. <laughs> so type Swami Mukund Anand. Uh, space. and i actually always wanted to discuss this with you but i couldn't relay the information correctly okay. even on our beach visits and all that <laughs> we i wanted to tell you this right. i'd love to know what you think of this as an astrophysicist yeah hmm. crazy hindu multiverse theory this is from 2 years ago okay to give the viewers and you some context he is uh, a spiritual guru yoga master hmm. uh and one of the most well read people of his domain that i had on the show i see and of everything we spoke to him about i think this segment was the best so just rewind to the top you remember this studio i do yeah <laughs> yeah so the fun mm. this was in the middle of covid when not everyone was willing to even do in person podcast that's see. where we met for the first time yeah we did of course yes play to highlights channel the rs clips subscribe hit that bell icon something i've been studying a lot of lately is astrophysics which is you know the physics of the universe black holes the stars and and the deeper you get into astrophysics you realize that The universe is massive. It's just incredibly large. You don't even understand how large it is. I mean, you think it's large? Just read a little bit of astrophysics, and your mind will be blown away by, uh, you know, how much more mega it is than you believe it is. Since you've read the Bhagavad Gita, since you've studied it, sir, since you've uh, read all these holy scriptures, uh, does any of the holy scriptures actually talk about the universe as in, you know, outer space? What's out there? Oh yeah, extremely in great detail. So it's so fascinating, Ranveer. The Western world, about seven hundred years ago, only knew that the Earth is flat. and they believe that the earth is the center of the universe that was the geocentric theory then it moved to the heliocentric theory that the sun is the center 
and our the scriptures in our traditions the name they have for geography is bhugol the earth is round they knew it all the while and they have explained in so much of detail that there are five mandals three trilokis seven lokas so the first is the chandra mandal whose lok is chandra lok it is uh, rotating around the mandal called the bhu mandal whose lok is bhu lok the earth planet but this bhu mandal is also not fixed it's rotating around the surya mandal whose lok is swar lok and the antarik the space in between is bhuva so this bhu bhuva swa creates one triloki but the surya mandal is also not fixed now this i'm telling you from these scriptures what they have described 5000 years ago mm. boss the surya mandal is also not fixed so he's saying the sun is revolving around something yes which is center of the milky way galaxy that's correct Pause this wherever you want to explain something, or you want to add a point or anything like that. Please. Sure. Surya Mandal is rotating around Parameshthi Mandal, and the Loka, the planet there, is Jana Lok, and the Parameshthi Mandal is rotating around another Mandal, Swayambhu Mandal, whose Loka is Brahma Lok. Pause. So all this, he's saying that the center of the Milky Way galaxy, technically, if you if we are doing that uh, cor corroboration mm -hmm. between uh, science and uh, dharma. Mm -hmm. He's saying that the center of the Milky Way galaxy is also revolving around something. That does make sense. Is that? Yeah, there is something called a local cluster, which is the local cluster of galaxies. For and and these galaxies are all coming closer together. For example, Milky Way and Andromeda. We, these two galaxies are coming closer together. Uh, they will merge in about 1.5 billion years so or But so. Are they rotating around something? Revolving around, around something? Yes, around a common center of mass. And no one knows what that is. Uh, we're not quite exactly sure where it is. It's so far away. It's an enormous, enormous area, and it's still just the local cluster. And he's calling that Brahma Lok. Okay. So, could it be a solar system, which uh, is also the home of Brahma? Like that. That's the. That's the way it's, it's perceived way. Yeah. yeah. It's, so it's it's the allegorical way of putting it. You know. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Play. Now, science tells us that like the sun, in the Milky Way there are a hundred billion suns. You know, and like the Milky Way, there are a hundred billion galaxies, which means that there are ten to the power twenty-two suns, approximately, in this entire universe. However, now science is talking about the multiverse theory, right? That there are other universes as well, and the Vedas say, you know what? How many universes are there? All of this that you are perceiving is one universe. Like this, there are infinite universes, and each with one Shankar, one Brahma, one Vishnu. Mm. Can I tell you a little story? Sure, sir. It is said that once Brahma went to meet Lord Krishna in Dwarka, and he asked the gatekeeper, "Tell Sri Krishna Brahma has come to meet him." So Sri Krishna asked the gatekeeper, "Tell him which Brahma is he?" He asked. Brahma ji was astonished. Is there any Brahma apart from me? So he tell him the four-headed Brahma, the father of the four Kumars. The gatekeeper said, "Sri Krishna called him in." So Brahma ji, on coming, he said, "Bhagwan, what was the meaning of your question? Which Brahma is there? Any Brahma apart from me?" So Lord Krishna smiled. By his yoga maya, he called the Brahmas of innumerable universes, and they were all coming and offering their pranams. And our Brahma ji saw that there is one Brahma who's got a thousand heads. <laughs> so our Chaturmukhi Brahma said, "How big will be his universe?" Mm. And then there was one Brahma who had one lakh heads, and one Brahma who had one crore heads, mm. and one Brahma who had one Arab one billion heads. So they keep Chaturmukhi Brahma, Hello Chamatkar, Krishna Re Charane Asi Karilo Namaskar. Our Brahma ji fell at the feet of Sri Krishna. Sri Krishna said, "In Brahma ji, there are infinite universes. Yours is the smallest. That is the extent of God's creation, and all of this is one fourth of creation. This is the material realm, and beyond this is three fourths, which is the spiritual realm, where this Maya, this Kal, this Karm cannot go. So that is when we say God is great. That's how great He is. What's out there in the three fourth? Boss, hmm. what's out there in the three fourth, sir?" Three fourths. I I don't know. So look, we I we the only data we have is the observational evidence. So uh, the mathematics tells us that there could be an innumerable number of universes out there. Yeah, uh, that's what quantum mechanics. One of one of the interpretations of quantum, of quantum mechanics uh, says this, and the string theory landscape also tells you that there could be ten raised to five hundred other universes out there. And uh, the multiverse theory in quantum mechanics, the multiverse interpretation says that. There could be essentially an infinite number of universes out there, but obviously we are confined in this universe, and we have no way of getting data from outside this universe. So there is no way to prove or disprove this theory. And yet, 
mathematically it makes sense and certain interpretations of quantum mechanics also say that this could be there so i think that's the kind of leap of imagination that our ancients also had they also imagined they also um, logically extrapolated that there could be multiple universes out there maybe an infinite number of universes maybe like ours or maybe different from ours maybe larger than ours maybe smaller than ours but that sort of thing so yeah i mean which other culture has come up with these thoughts obviously we don't have data or i don't know as far as i know we don't have data but who knows you know so that's the kind of thing i mean i have, i don't know of any other culture or any, or any other civilization that has come up with these uh, leaps of imagination and and you know that itself is it, in physics we have something called a redankin experiment which means a thought experiment there are certain things you can't really test using physical instruments but you can test using logic and your mind's imagination and that's what you do typically when it comes to uh, thinking about how black holes work and how how things beyond uh, at the quantum domain and, and further down there work so maybe our ancients were also doing some kind of quantum uh, thought experiments and like like you say in philosophy and spirituality that there's an external universe out there and there's an there's an entire internal universe within you and to understand the external universe you have to use uh, data instruments and observations and to understand the internal universe you have to meditate and go deep within and maybe there's a there's a connection between the two and there you have the mystery of consciousness and all that which science still cannot uh, explain so yeah there's so much to unravel in this but it's it's beautiful to see what our ancients came up with and uh, they that's the legacy that we have inherited from them uh I just want to play the rest of the clip where yeah. he explains the remaining three fourth, which mm-hmm. is the spiritual realm. Okay. Yeah. It's indescribable because our words can only compare with the glories of what we see here, mm. right? Now let us say that we wish to give a comparison. We will give it with material things, and that is made by a different energy. So this material realm is made by an energy called Maya, the material energy. and we see the so much of glory in every aspect of material creation you know from the tiniest higgs boson to the biggest galaxies to cristiano ronaldo sure <laughs> <laughs> absolutely if there's glory manifesting in every one to sachin tendulkar so now all of this is glorious imagine the glory of yoga maya when the computer revolution started one college boy came up to me and said swami ji what computer does god use to keep an account of our karmas So I said, you know, computer is made by the material energy, and God has a superior energy called Yoga Maya, by virtue of which He knows everything that we thought of from the time we were born till today, not of one lifetime but our infinite lifetimes, and not one soul but infinite souls of creation. So how does God manage to do all that? By His Yoga Maya. By that Yoga Maya, He creates His divine abode. So let it suffice to say that it is Sat Chit and Anand. It is eternal. full of bliss now can you imagine objects made of bliss mm. and sentient consciousness so that abode is satchid anand full of divine bliss it's for the perfected souls that means when we reach that perfection we will then be there can you become imperfect when you go there you fail a test there once we are situated in knowledge then the ignorance will not overcome us again tad vishnu paramam padam sada pashyanti suraya it's the, the soul is on a journey you know so in the journey we are slowly growing we're taking a few steps ahead maybe a few steps back and then again a few steps ahead but once we reach that perfection it means that now we are situated in knowledge so when you have divine bliss then why should you choose something far inferior yeah. <laughs> what is god sir god i mean there are so many ways of looking at god but if you want well a computer computer scientist source perspective god is the programmer of the universe you know and mathematics is the language of the of the, it's the programming language i'll pause you yeah i'll take you back to this clip now what did you make of what he said just like how did your mind perceive this i want to now i want to speak to the scientist in you as well as the human being yeah so what he says is that we uh, there is some somewhere a register of our karma right all the actions and their merits and demerits are recorded somewhere somewhere out there and the soul is infinite so we enter a physical body we live a lifetime we accumulate karma positive as well as negative it is all added to the balance book the register and then we pass on we leave this material shell and we then move on to another lifetime and that sort of thing and this happens possibly an infinite number of times that's what he is saying and that's what our our culture believes that's what our civilization believes and 
and many other cultures believe in this in the transmigration of the soul so there is a balance book somewhere a register somewhere that stores all the positive and negative aspects of our actions and 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 that uh, is something that continues over lifetimes so maybe there is a database somewhere or maybe the universe itself it has so many atoms i mean you cannot even imagine how many atoms atoms we have so maybe it is recorded somewhere out there in the in the cosmos and somehow somebody is keeping track of what what uh, positive and negative merits and demerits of our actions we are accruing and maybe it's passing on throughout the lifetimes and maybe there is a point to all of this somewhere which maybe somebody as small as me would not understand but maybe there's a big grand purpose the grand scheme of things in which all of this has some actual purpose and makes sense if thoughts and memories are analyzed from a biological perspective hmm. they are basically neural patterns in your brain and the brains of people who have been witness to those thoughts and memories Right. quite possibly i mean uh, consciousness thoughts all that seem to be an emergent behavior emerging out of the complexity of our neurons uh, i don't know how many neurons we have trillions of them and they are all interconnected in various various ways and that's a neural network i mean we have spoken about ai and all that so that's a neural network it's a biological neural network and the neurological perspective the scientific perspective is that um, all of this all of these thoughts behaviors emotions language everything consciousness it was it is all an emergent property of that emerges out of this com, this interconnected complexity of our brain uh but there is no way of proving it i mean we mm. can read brain waves and all and we can see that you know in certain conditions we certain regions of, of the brains brain are activated and all that but we still don't have definitive evidence that goes one way or the other it's i mean i'll tell you what uh, consciousness is a very big deal these days in in physics of all places not biology but physics of course the biologists and neuroscientists are, are looking at consciousness from their own perspective in physics because of the the quantum angle we have research being done on consciousness what consciousness is but it's more of a philosophical pursuit the philosophy uh, the philosophy of physics and the problem that we are facing is that we don't even have a definition of consciousness we have the definition of what uh, light is what energy is what mass is what matter is and so on and so forth various measures and weights and all that we don't know what consciousness is we can't even define it and yet we we have to make sense of it but we are unable to so that is the the possibly the most profound mystery in all science in addition to time we also don't know what time is and maybe these two are correlated somehow consciousness and time and time and time big mysteries that's why science is so interesting that's why fundamental theoretical physics is so interesting because we know next to nothing and there's nothing more interesting to me at least than a mystery big mystery and the mysteries don't get bigger than this consciousness and time and time my question is you said something like we using quantum dash to understand uh conscious what did you say so there are certain interpretations of quantum mechanics see see we know what the equations of quantum mechanics are okay we can use the schrodinger equation the klein gordon equation the dirac equation to solve various problems in quantum mechanics we know the equations we know how to use them we know how to use them to solve problems we have solved nuclear you know so nuclear fission nuclear fusion we can use quantum mechanics in technologies we would not have any of this without quantum technologies but i'll, I'll have to pause you a little bit quantum mechanics is the mechanics of the quantum world the mm. quantum world is the world in a microscopic level so if you take a glass this is made up of atoms if you can crunch yourself down like ant man and go to the world of atoms physics is different there mechanics is different there the rules of physics are not the same rules you've read in eighth standard in your physics books the rules of physics change absolutely now i'll let you go on uh, because i want to know how quantum mechanics can actually help us understand consciousness in the first place right so so yeah that's that's exactly what it is it is the it is the physics of the ultra microscopic world atoms subatomic subatomic particles molecules all that that's the quantum domain that's a quantum view of the world go deep down all the way down there and the rules the laws of physics are extremely different they're completely non intuitive a particle can be in two places at the same time a particle can also be a wave a wave can also be a particle particles can go through walls solid walls tunnel through them and so on extremely weird behavior but that's how the world works and obviously all of this that we have around us emerges from the quantum world so this microphone it's solid metal or whatever it is but the properties the, which are classical from our perspective just regular properties they actually emerge from the quantum world and therefore so must our brain so must our biology the dna and molecules all that and if consciousness is an emergent property of the universe emerges out of complex uh, you know uh, organs like the brain then 
there should be a quantum element to that as well and then there is the possibility that <laughs> in quantum mechanics there are very weird things for example the collapse of the wave function which i will be very hard to explain but you know an atom an atom can be in multiple states of existence in multiple places at the same time but the moment you look at it all those states collapse and there's only one place left so when you're not looking at it it could be in multiple places at the same time we know that but the moment you take a, do an observation it suddenly appears in only one place and everything else disappears mm. all the other locations somehow magically disappear so maybe mm. maybe the act of observing it with an, a consciousness causes the collapse of the wave function maybe consciousness is what causes collapse possibly that's one of the interpretations it's not the only interpretation there are many other interpretations but maybe consciousness possibly perhaps could be responsible for particles that are in in a fuzzy state of existence to suddenly resolve themselves in one place so that would make consciousness an integral part of physics and quantum mechanics Oof. then the question is what is quantum what is consciousness and why does it do this is if it, it is the case it's perhaps an entity in the quantum world which we are figuring out how to quantify maybe maybe there's a whole field of consciousness maybe consciousness is not just here maybe this is just a manifestation of a universal consciousness maybe the entire universe is a conscious organism i mean there are various theories that are actually philosophical theories not scientific theories these are philosophical theories there is something called panpsychism there is something called cosmopsychism cosmopsychism says that the entire universe is conscious is there any proof no can we disprove it no <laughs> panpsychism means everything every object in the universe has a certain degree of consciousness a rock has doesn't have zero consciousness it has very low consciousness a tree has way higher consciousness than, than a rock but way less than us a dog a cat different levels of consciousness humans as far as we know the highest level of consciousness we can introspect we can think about ourselves we can meta think think about our own consciousness and all that and maybe there's something higher out there as well so there are different ways of looking at it and it's a fascinating problem and we don't even have a definition of what consciousness is and that's one of the big open problems is there a book or a movie that you've read or that you heard about that would help people wrap their head no there's nothing there's <laughs> none that i know of <laughs> why don't i twist the question a little bit hmm. and uh, maybe it's possibly the end of this podcast this is a nice meaty experiment but what's a nice movie recommendation that you'd give out to people other than interstellar oh look i love all kinds of movies i would say mask watch the mask if you want a riot of laughs you want to mm. laugh a lot watch the mask <laughs> jim carrey i mean who's yeah. funnier than jim carrey if you want fantasy watch the lord of the rings that's a three part series if you want science fiction there's so many i, I my childhood favorite always obviously uh, star wars this matrix there are so many more these days i'm not sure what but oh i can give so many so many examples i mean so many movies i've watched the fifth element science fiction and comedy comes together it's from the turn of the century really funny movie but some people hate it some people like it i love it personally uh so many movies uh, the matrix i could maybe put out a list of 50 movies and put a make a list or something but yeah i love movies i mean it's mm. part of culture it's part of growing up it's part of experiencing the world sometimes you learn things from it sometimes you just forget about whatever you're up to and just immerse yourself in that so great mm. fun i have my list of movies that are linked down below from a past solo podcast <laughs> all right all right uh again for me it's all about dark twisted etc etc uh the one movie i watched which wasn't dark and twisted but i enjoyed it a lot i watched it recently it's an indian movie it's a hindi movie it's called kho gaye hum kahan kho gaye hum kahan yeah okay. it's got sidan chaturvedi uh adarsh gorav and ananya pande mm -hmm. all three acted incredibly well mm -hmm. i think the director isn't getting as much public credit as he should because i would believe that he's the writer as well it's not an evergreen film in terms of people will watch it 30 years later possibly not relate older generations may not relate but anyone who's active on social media and understands how social media can change your experience of life will relate immensely i see like i will show this movie to my kids hmm. uh, as a bit of a time capsule hmm to tell them that hey you know this is what daddy had to do to make this house for you <laughs> like uh but i that's this is the first thought i had after seeing the film hmm very real representation of urban india uh in 
three and four and five possibly. I see. And a lot of the psychological problems, a lot of the status oriented problems, a mm. lot of the social media related problems. Mm. Incredible film. I see. And it's one of those films where you really want to know what happens next, despite there not being a very intense storyline. I see. It's just everyday lives of these characters, relatable. You know. A version of Ananya Pandey around you. You know a version of Sudhanshu Chaturvedi. You know a version of Adarsh Gaurav. I see. Uh, that's the feeling it evokes, and it has some deep dialogue, some non-verbal scenes, mm -hmm. things that they do. You know how they interact with their own cell phones, which we take for granted now because actually it's a body part. Almost like yeah, yeah, true, yeah, agree. Now it's as impactful on your life as your brain in so many ways. Would you argue? It's an extension of your brain, kind of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Extension of your personality, extension of your brain. Yeah. The way you choose your background to be on your phone. Mm. Do you keep your phone on vibrate or loud? It mm. says so much about you. It says so much about something we never yeah. think of. Yeah. That movie will make you think about things like this. I see. I yeah. See. There'll be lots of people who won't relate to the film, mm. won't like the film. But if you're someone who's living in urban India, oh my god, I would argue the urban world, not just urban India, because now urban India is on par with how. the urban world things hmm. like when i talk to people i meet from america or europe the problems are the same the insecurities are the same the cultural likes and dislikes are the same the icons are the same hmm. the processes of content creation and content consumption are the same definitely so for that whole segment of people oh my god hmm tempted to watch it oh certainly i'll check it out okay yeah and the other one society of the snow which one would you rather watch honestly I would first go with Society of the Snow because that's a really raw story, a really emotional story. I know the storyline, but I would like to see how it's depicted, and obviously it'll bring up, bring the, the entire thing. It'll hit home when you watch it. I'm sure. So yeah, every dialogue matters in Society of the Snow. Hmm. Not in the way that Nolan's dialogues matter. We have to keep up with the plot, but just uh -huh. every dialogue is poetic. Hmm. Uh, that's all I'll say. All right. End of this casual experimental episode, sir. I hope you had fun. I had fun. Absolutely. Okay. What did you make of this episode? I loved it. Loved Think, it. Things came out, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah. It's a bit of a new flavor. Yeah. We'll honestly want audience feedback. If you guys like it, we'll do these kind of more chill episodes more regularly. But you need, you need all stars on the show for this kind of a vibe. So I hope all stars, sir, you had fun. Thank you so much. I had great fun. Thank okay. you so much. That was the episode. I personally would love to do more episodes like this, not just with AC, but with all the other all stars we've had on TRS and our all stars. A spectacular minds anyway. I love having casual conversations with these spectacular minds because you guys know how much knowledge is hidden within. You guys are familiar with these people. I personally adore this almost Joe Rogan experience style conversation. So tell me what you think. Uh, I'm curious to see how many views this particular podcast gets. I'm curious to know what you guys have in terms of advice for the future of the English version of TRS. The Hindi version is kind of building itself. the english version is where i'm trying to reinvent a little bit so please let me know if this is a direction that we should take give me a feedback tell me in the comment section and make sure you keep supporting trs because there's lots more coming your way it's only the start of 2024